Sure. This is one way to move things ahead. This is, you've just seen an example of self-help in international law. Um, in, the, uh, in my colleague's absence, I will do the briefest of introductions, but as you'll know, this is the Charles Brower Lecture. Um, we are indebted to Charlie for having endowed this lecture, and it's immediately become uh, a highlight of the, uh, of the uh, annual meeting. Uh, and I know it's a cliche, but I'll use it anyhow. Uh, given that this is a, the, a lecture in international dispute resolution, there's nobody who could better suit it to do it, which is why we were enormously pleased when, I guess it was a year and a half ago, actually, with Lori's permission, uh, I invited Michael to do the, to do the lecture. Uh, you will all know him. Introductions would surely um, uh, use up a time that we could otherwise use uh, hearing Michael, who surely has. I, when I think about Michael, I think of Harold's co-introduction, Harold's introduction a year or so ago, uh, when they did the Lieber, and Harold said the first time I have, when I think about any legal issue on any topic, the first thing I do is see what Michael has written on it. Uh, and I thought that was a wonderful way to describe the, the status that Michael holds in international law, and particularly amongst U.S. international lawyers. So, Michael, welcome. Charlie, thank you. Thank you very much, Donald. And before I start, I'd like to say a few words about Charles Brower, who's been a friend for many years, a friend to the American Society of International Law, to international law in general, and to many of the people in this audience. Uh, yesterday, in a very eloquent statement, uh, Judge Higgins, in speaking of uh, Judge Keith, talked about a man who'd worn many hats and had done honor to all of them. And I think that that can certainly be applied to Charles Brower, whether it was serving as a government official, as a private attorney, as a judge on the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, as an ad hoc judge. Uh, Charles Brower has distinguished himself for his commitment to the specific role that he was discharging. And in addition to that, has been able to carry everything off with extraordinary style. Anyone who knows Charlie personally will just know his extraordinary joie de vivre, which is just infectious. Charles' generosity to the society is something that is not, I think, entirely appreciated. In many ways, the culture of giving that is now a part of the life of this society is a legacy of Charles Brower's presidency of the society. So, Charlie, I consider this a very rare privilege to speak at a lecture that bears your name, and I want to affirm my lasting friendship for you. I propose to talk about an aspect of international investment arbitration that will, I think, give some discomfort to the government officials who are in the audience today, though I'm sure they've wrestled with the problem that I intend to address. One discontent with international investment arbitration that seems to be shared by both capital importing and capital exporting states is that the investment tribunals exceed their proper limits in applying the so-called fair and equitable treatment standard, or FET. I submit, first, that FET's vitality is a function of the type of rule that it is. Second, that the diminished capacity of states to control FET's arbitral evolution is a consequence of the democratization of the contemporary customary international law process and third, that states' efforts to confine the exercise of arbitrators' judgment in each application of FET, especially by trying to anchor it to the minimum standard, are as futile as King Canute's attempt to control the tides, hence the title of this lecture. But to make my case, allow me to begin with two excurses. 
The first is from the realm of legal theory and has to do with the types of rule formulations to which lawmakers resort. And the second is a comment on the nature of contemporary customary international law as it affects rules such as FET and the minimum standard. But first, the rules. When lawmakers set out to enact policy into law, they have at their disposal two species of rules. One transfers to the ultimate rule applier the most limited exercise of discretion. Scholars from John Austin on have coined various terms for rules of this type. I propose to call them verification rules because their most salient characteristic is that they authorize those charged with applying them to do nothing more than verify compliance with an explicit metric. A mundane example might be that the swinging door to a washroom in a workplace must be no more than five inches from the floor. A momentous example is that an ICBM is to be fired by the officer in the silo only upon receiving a coded signal from the president. Verification rules are binary, either or rules. Beyond that binary information, the factual and normative universe to which the person charged with applying the rules may turn is strictly confined to a few explicit variables, none of which includes general evaluative concepts such as fairness, equity, justice, minimum order, efficiency, or even common sense. What we may call evaluation rules, by contrast, do not contain a binary metric. Instead, they establish a goal that is expressed at some level of generality. For example, Article 39 of the United Nations Charter. The Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, and shall make recommendations or decide what measures shall be taken to maintain or restore international peace and security. Realizing the goal of Article 39 requires its employers, in this instance permanent representatives in the Council, to take account of a range of variables and to exercise judgment as to their contribution in varying idiosyncratic contexts to realizing that goal that has been specified. Both evaluation and verification rules involve judgment, but that judgment is very different in terms of scope and methodology. The legislator's use of verification rules generally increases as one descends the application ladder. Resort to evaluation rules generally increases as one ascends the hierarchy. By that, I don't mean to suggest that verification rules are reserved for trivial or second order policy issues. To the contrary, they may deal with matters of the gravest consequence. Consider, for example, rules that treat capital punishment. The prohibition of capital punishment as found in Protocol 13 of the European Convention on Human Rights is a quintessential verification rule. Article 1 under the Chapeau Abolition of the Death Penalty states, the death penalty shall be abolished. No one shall be condemned to such penalty or, or executed. Article 2 states, no derogation from the provisions of the protocol shall be made under Article 15 of the Convention. To irrevocably nail down the absolute character of the prohibition, Article 3 states that no reservation may be made under Article 57 of the Convention in respect to the provisions of this protocol. Now, Compare Protocol 13 to the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The Eighth Amendment is an evaluation rule inasmuch as it requires whoever is applying it to determine whether the death penalty is a cruel and unusual punishment. In selecting a verification rule as the vehicle for their policy, Legislators wish to drastically reduce, if not entirely exclude, the exercise of discretion by those downstream who will be applying it. That wish notwithstanding, law is dialectical and parties in adversarial proceedings often try to force suppliers 
to introduce considerations into an erstwhile verification rule. The opposite may occur with evaluation rules. In a judicial system of stare decisis, evaluation rules may take on verification characteristics. If the unequivocal judgments of the highest court or a jurisprudence constant of other courts so decides. Thus, to stay with our capital punishment example, the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment might seem to have become an absolute prohibition of capital punishment were the Supreme Court to unambiguously so decide, but only as long as the social, economic, technological, moral, and ethical variables at the time of each new judgment persist. The point is that it is in the nature of the linguistic structure of an evaluation rule that it retains the potential for re-evaluation, even if the rule seems to have morphed in successive applications into what is taken as a verification rule, it always remains open to reconsideration in terms of other variables, including popular morality and ethics. In a system like international investment law, which lacks stare decisis, the application of evaluation rules, especially those whose variables reference popular moral or ethical conceptions, can always change or evolve. Now, <clears throat> state officials, now state officials, when concluding treaties or in uncoordinated but parallel action shaping customary international law, are obviously engaged in lawmaking. Depending on their specific policy objectives and their implementation scenarios, they will find both verification and evaluation rules useful. Both customary international law's minimum standard of treatment, or I'll refer to it as MST, and the obligation to afford fair and equitable treatment, FET, terms whose, over, uh, whose contents overlap if they've not become congruent, are both evaluation rules. Because each instance of application of evaluation rules reinstantiates them in different contexts, they can scarcely avoid evolving, a fortiori, as social, economic, technological, moral, and ethical variables change. And this leads to my second excursus, a consideration of some of the features of contemporary customary international law and their consequences for certain evaluation rules for the tribunals applying them, and for the states in the dock before them. Hans Kelsen explained that law, nomos, can be viewed in nomostatic and nomodynamic terms. His distinction sets in relief the curiously contradictory ways in which international lawyers look at customary international law. Nomodynamically, Customary international law is a video of an ongoing, informal, and unorganized process of consuetude and desuetude of formation, confirmation, transformation, and termination of shared expectations and demands about the right ways of doing things. Nomos statically, customary international law is one still frame of that video a snapshot of those expectations and demands that were shaped in that informal and unorganized process of law formation. The snapshot redacts those expectations and demands as rules, but the resulting nomostatic codex of customary international law begins to blur in part and change in part the moment it is redacted, thanks to the nomodynamic process of customary international law. As a result, juridical depictions of customary law tend to be double exposures. Viewed nomostatically, the substance of contemporary customary international law at any moment is a reticulate network of authoritative expectations and demands about what constitutes right behavior expressed in the form of verification and evaluation rules. In its nomodynamic representation, those normative expectations are produced, sustained, and adjusted in the myriad interactions of politically relevant international actors. With all due respect to the ILC and its important work on customary international law, I use the word 
politically relevant international actors rather than states. Many categories of non-state actors in the different social and economic zones of the complex archipelagos of contemporary international law now participate in shaping expectations and demands of right behavior. Yet, even the ILC's narrower understanding of state practice has come to include, in addition to the traditional diplomatic exchanges and other direct interactions between states, behavior within and through external institutions created by states. These include international organizations, commissions, agencies, courts, and international tribunals. All of these composite actors participate in the shaping of authoritative expectations that constitute contemporary customary international law, a point Dr. Arsanjani made in her lecture at the Hague Academy in 2012. One phenomenon in which state and non-state actors coordinate in the formation of customary international law is state delegated practice. International investment tribunals provide a clear example of this phenomenon. When parties to a treaty agree that an arbitration tribunal may render binding decisions on the interpretation or application of that treaty, the decisions of that tribunal can constitute for the states concerned both state practice and thanks to the requirement of explicit reasoning in terms of international law, opinio juris. To be sure, in this species of state delegated practice, it is only the practice of an opinio juris of the two litigating states that we encounter. But its contribution to the formation of more general opinio juris is amplified for two reasons. First, the manifestation of this form of state delegated practice is reasoned awards. Those awards are couched in general international law terms. Recall that Article 38 of the ICJ statute recognizes judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law. The dispositive of the award is the practice component. The reasoning of the award is its opinio juris. In international investment law, arbitral interpretation of legal terms such as FET and MST recurring in thousands of treaties of the same genre cannot but contribute to the generality of the opinio juris of the decisions. Ironically, states themselves contribute to the rapid accretion of opinio juris in this state-delegated practice phenomenon. Litigants before international investment tribunals almost always invoke the prior decisions of international courts and tribunals as evidence of the existence of a rule of international law, the one, of course, which they believe discriminates in their favor. The tribunals to whom the prior decisions have been addressed in turn are constrained to discuss and incorporate them in their own decisions. The consequent recurring invocation of previous decisions of international courts and tribunals serves to confirm the existence of opinio juris. Thus, Professor Crawford, as he then was, observes, the international court will often infer the existence of opinio juris from a general practice, from scholarly consensus, or from its own or other tribunals' previous determinations. Oppenheim explains, judicial decision has become a most important factor in the development of international law, and the authority and persuasive power of judicial decisions may sometimes give them greater significance than they enjoy formally. In this regard, one should recall that the formation of customary international law does not require the inclusion of all states, nor complete uniformity in state behavior. The International Court in Nicaragua, the United States, dialed back the more stringent standard it had laid down 17 years earlier in North Sea Continental Shelf. There it had said, with respect to the formation of customary international law, that the practice must be both extensive and virtually uniform. In Nicaragua, the ICJ revised that dictum, holding now that, quote, it does not consider that for a rule to be established as customary, the corresponding practice must be absolutely rigorous conformity, in absolutely rigorous conformity with the rule. Hence, 
as Professor now Judge Crawford put it, a particular rule of international law may have less than universal acceptance, yet still form part of international law. The fact that this is happening rather quickly does not itself mean that customary international law is not being formed. Traditionally, when the pace of change was for the most part deliberate and measured compared to the frenetic pace of so many things in our own era, a long period of practice was deemed a requirement for the formation of custom. But this was a function of the prevailing rate of change rather than something inherent in the nature of custom. In contemporary international law, that requirement has been adjusted to take into account the context of rapid, often radical, sometimes disjunctive development in trade, science, and technology with their very strong need for international regulation. At our annual meeting in 1965, I go back a long way, <laughs> Professor Celo Engel coined the term pressure-cooked custom and more recently, Professor Condorelli spoke of coutume grande vitesse. And speaking of grande vitesse, I will move rapidly through some of this. I commenced this lecture by noting that some states' parties to the investment treaties have chafed at the consequences of the evaluation character and evolution of FET and have sought ways of trying to transform them into something more closely approximating a verification rule. The most direct method would be simply to exclude FET or MS, MST from the list of protection guarantees of new treaties and to replace them with verification rules. But because often the same state both imports and exports foreign investment any state anticipating that its own investors may have to rely on the bid would be foregoing significant protections against the wide range of potential deprivations that can only be addressed by some evaluation rules. Another method would be to try to reduce FET and MST from evaluation rules to a codex of verification rules. If that could be done, it would also forego the very flexibility of an evaluation rule, which is precisely why lawmakers sometimes adopt them. Still another method for dealing with a troubling line of FET decisions would be to try to access the state-to-state -state arbitration option in many bits, as have both Peru and Ecuador, and to seek an authoritative and restrictive interpretation of the FET clause. But even if the state-to-state -state tribunal sees were to accept jurisdiction for this revisory function and in that process, revise a treaty for the benefit of third parties who would not be represented. And even if these tribunals were then to render an award confirming one specific and restrictive interpretation, it would not extinguish the protean potential of that evaluation rule in future applications. As many in this audience will know, Canada, Mexico, and the United States have resorted to a different method. Some investment treaties put third-party beneficiaries whose investments they have wished to induce on express notice that the treaty's privileges and protections are subject to change by some type of prearranged procedure. The North American Free Trade Agreement provides an instructive example. Article 2001 establishes a soi disant Free Trade Commission, or FTC, consisting of the three states' parties to the treaty. The FTC is empowered to resolve disputes that may arise regarding its interpretation or application. Article 1131 provides that while a tribunal established under this section shall decide the issues in dispute in accordance with this agreement and applicable laws, laws, rules of international law, an interpretation by the commission of a provision of this agreement shall be binding on a tribunal. Now, NAFTA Article 1105 famously prescribes that each party shall accord to the investments of investors of another party treatment in accordance with international law, including fair and equitable treatment and full protection and security. Thus, Article 1105 incorporates three evaluation rules, the MST, FET, and full protection and security, so that it's not 
does not feel discriminated against, let's call it FPS, so we will not be dealing with it. <clears throat> the NAFTA states' parties were apparently dissatisfied with some of the interpretations tribunals were giving to one of the evaluation rules in Article 1105. So on 31 July 2001, the FTC tried to reduce its evaluation character by deciding in relevant part that, and I'll read this carefully, Article 11051 prescribes the customary international law minimum standard of treatment of aliens as the minimum standard of treatment to be afforded to investments of investors of another party. Second paragraph. <clears throat> The concepts of fair and equitable treatment and full protection and security do not require treatment in addition to or beyond that which is required by the customary international law minimum standard of treatment of aliens. Now, it's clear that both MST and FET are evaluation rules and can relate to the same sorts of actions that a state takes vis-a-vis -vis an alien. There is, of course, a threshold difference the customary international law minimum standard relates to all aliens qua aliens, while FET applies only to a specific category of aliens, the qualified investors of one of the nationals of a state party to one of the thousands of or bilateral, multilateral investment treaties affording that protection. Minimum standard of treatment of aliens, MST, refers to the obligation of a state to afford a common standard of treatment to aliens in their treaty in their territory. The, it's, M, the MST extends to a number of areas, including the right to be free from a denial of justice, the right of aliens to protection of life and against bodily harm, the right of both alien individuals and corporations to their juridical personality recognized by the receiving state, and the right to compensation for expropriations. MST also grants a number of procedural rights to aliens, including freedom of access to courts, the right to unbiased hearings, the right to participate in hearings, and the right to a judgment in accordance with the law of the state within a reasonable time. Some governments seem to assume that international law is MST, if unqualified by FET language, permits a government to treat aliens unfairly and inequitably, and I'll return to that. MST is itself a composite of evaluation rules, and the reason for them being evaluation rules is not recondite. Take denial of justice, a principal component of MST. John Bassett Moore wrote that he did not consider it to be practical to lay down in advance precise and unyielding formulas by which the question of the denial of justice may in every instance be determined. As part of customary international law, and especially as an evaluation rule, MST is nomodynamic and is thus an evolving concept capable of changing a state practice and opinio juris change. Holland Dickinson, in his entry in the Encyclopedia of Public International Law, wrote, as a principle of customary international law, the content of MST will continue to develop and change over time. The content of the standard will likely continue to be created through the dispute settlement process, including through ICSID, which is committed to establishing a rule of law in the area of foreign investment. Its own nomodynamism makes MST an odd choice by the NAFTA states for anchoring FET as a means of confining the latter's evaluative character. But ladies and gentlemen, modern governments have more options than did old King Canute. The evaluative character of MST does not in itself mean that in setting the ground rules for the tribunals they are empowering, states cannot explicitly exclude the application of certain rules of customary international law. Because international law recognizes the practice of adjudication on an agreed basis and the notion of lex specialis, the FTC's interpretation could have been crafted as a stabilization clause that is, the Commission could have stated that Article 1105 was to be applied by reference to customary international law's minimum standard as of a date certain, let's say 1926. If the FTC had elected this approach, then thereafter, NAFTA tribunals would have been confined to a historical exercise, determining what the minimum standard was as of 1926. Assuming no issue of a subsequent Jus Kogans, 
NAFTA tribunals would have been precluded from applying subsequent customary and international law developments in the minimum standard. Rather, they would have been obliged to apply what they knew to be anachronistic customary international law formulations, a dilemma that any tribunal that's presented with a stabilization clause is faced with. The FTC didn't do this. As a consequence, NAFTA tribunals, like other international courts and tribunals, must apply the contemporary content of the minimum standard of treatment of aliens. In San Juan River, the international court said, even assuming that the notion of commerce does not have the same meaning today as it did in the mid-19th century, it is the present meaning which must be accepted for purposes of applying the treaty. Indeed, even if the FTC had undertaken to stabilize the meaning of the minimum standard as of, let's say, 1926, subsequent NAFTA tribunals would still be compelled to apply in an odd form of international law originalism an evaluation rule as it existed circa 1926. Only if the FTC had carefully formulated an justum generis provision limited to very specific minimum standards, for example, something on the order of whether a detention without court order exceeded 96 hours or in a cell less than eight by five meters or whether corporal punishment exceeded, let us say, 20 lashes during, administered during daylight on two consecutive days, would the evaluation rule have been transformed into a verification rule with the result that each tribunal's ambit of judgment would henceforth be confined to confirming compliance with a single precise metric. I will not explore the Yus Kogan's implications of that hypothetical, but would observe that states that became or, or wished to become switch hitters, both importing and exporting foreign investment, and also sought to protect their own investors and citizens abroad, would likely pause before eviscerating the evaluation component of the minimum standard. <clears throat> the great irony of the FTC initiative <clears throat> <clears throat> is that the effort to supp supplant FET with MST has simply replaced one evaluation rule with another. The same generative force of customary international law that I considered earlier now proceeds under the rubric of minimum standard of treatment of aliens instead of the rubric of fair and equitable treatment. Tide one, Canute zero. <laughs> How have NAFTA tribunals responded to the effort to confine the evaluation character of FET? Some, but not all of the NAFTA tribunals have recognized that the content of customary international law referred to in 11051 is not limited to international laws that existed in the 19th century or even in the early decades of the 20th, but that its content, as the Mandev tribunal put it, is shaped by the conclusion of more than 2,000 bilateral investment treaties and many treaties of friendship and commerce. Mandev not only rejected the notion that customary international law standard of treatment is, was the same as was pronounced by Near v. Mexico nearly a century early, earlier, it went further challenging the standards set by Near as even relevant to investment disputes. For the Mandev Tribunal, the development of international law with respect to the status of individuals and the protection of foreign investment was a further reason for challenging not only the content of earlier notions of the minimum standard, but in particular the standard set by Nier. Mandev went further, recognizing the significance of the jurisprudence of arbitral tribunals in determining the content of the fair and equitable treatment requirement of Article 11051. Mandev was followed by ADF Group, which took many of the same positions. I won't, in the written version of this essay, I have very detailed excerpts from all of the judgments, both for and against. I won't inflict them on you. But we'll move on to... Uh, conclusion to reward you for your patience.
The ultimately futile efforts to roll back the evolution of the international community's expectations and demands for fair and equitable treatment and a minimum standard of treatment import a high intellectual and moral burden on international tribunals. While they are not lawmakers, and in my view should not view themselves as such, the prevalence of evaluation rules in their normative armamentarium makes them inevitable participants in the shaping of custom, customary international law. Inevitably, their decisions play a role in reinforcing or modifying authoritative expectations of right behavior. Weighty responsibility is an incident of authoritative empowerment, whether the empowered are state officials, international civil servants, international arbitrators, or scholars discharging the function assigned to them by Article 38 of the statute. Even then, while all people are created equal, not all legal initiatives are, not all state practice, not all awards, not all scholarship will contribute to the formation of customary international law. Not all will prove efficient and prudent enough to win a pineal juris. If they succeed, one component of their success will, be the, will have been the quality of the work of their respective authors. Indeed, if the rule of law is to succeed in any of its phases, every role in its process, whether international or national, requires of the individual who performs it the faithful discharge of the power and authority assigned to them. That too is a critical factor in achieving fair and equitable treatment. Thank you. By all means, it's my business. <laughs> so, floor is open for questions. Or there's, a, there's a microphone here. That intimidating a tour de force that nobody can even respond. Here we go. What a disappointment, Steve. I thought I'd frightened everyone into submission. <laughs> but not Steve. Well, I, I permit me to say that I'm in essential agreement with your analysis uh, and um, uh, with you uh, deplore uh, that um, statement of the, of the commission. Uh, uh, one question which occurred to me when I read that statement and its reliance on customary international law was the indication repeatedly by resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly that there was no agreement in the international community on the content of relevant customary international law. Uh, that was certified by the Supreme Court of the United States in Sabatino. And certainly if one looks at the record of disputes in the United Nations in the 1960s and 1970s over permanent sovereignty over natural resources, uh, the new international economic order, the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States. It's perfectly plain uh, that while the traditional capital exporting states had one view of the content of customary international law in this sphere, to which you've referred. Many other states, whose numbers exceeded those of the capital exporters, not only had a different view of the content of customary international law, they took the position that there was no customary international law. Uh, in the light of that fact, 
Was it not odd that the um, commission interpreting NAFTA uh, nailed its standard to customary international law rather than the particular provisions of NAFTA and other investment treaties? That's my question. Very odd indeed, Judge Schwebel. And very odd indeed. <laughs> the, the notion, what I find particularly troubling, and, and I have an analysis of the case law in which Mondev and is analyzed and I find very persuasive. Uh, the notion that's introduced in Glamis Gold that custom cannot be proved, is virtually impossible to prove, and if it's not proved, you go back to, for some reason, near v. Mexico in the mid-1920s, a case that has nothing to do with the protection of direct foreign investors, that, that I find absolutely baffling. Uh, also, having said that arbitration awards do not provide evidence of customary international law, which I've tried to dispose of as a theoretical matter, uh, Glamis Gold, which is the strongest intellectual statement in this regard, goes back and picks near v. Mexico as an arbitral award, which somehow or other is evidence of customary international law. The proof of, that one finds in Glamis Gold is well, there are five paragraphs to the award, and the sum total of examination of practice is one quotation from an article in the American Journal by John Bassett Moore, good authority indeed, and uh, two pages from De La Pradelle and Politis' two-volume book. So we have here a circle in, uh, in which we're told that uh, Arbitral awards do not constitute evidence of customary international law, yet near is cited as evidence of customary international law. And there is also something truly perverse in trying to apply in the 21st century the notions of what is fair with respect, fair and equitable, uh, with a century earlier. Surely, for all of our, the dreadful things that have happened in the century in between, we've advanced somewhat in our notion of what is fair and equitable, one would hope. Uh, Patrick Norton. Could you elaborate a little bit on your, your thinking that arbitral decisions are a form of delegated state practice? I understand that states that have set up this process are bound in the particular case by the result, by the dispositif, if you will. But I would not understand that they're necessarily bound by the rationale of the court, or the, or the tribunal, rather, uh, or even by a, a series of decisions by the tribunals. If, if there are four or five cases, is that law that's binding on them, even though that, that wasn't their original intention? I thank you for the question. Uh, it's been some time since I've seen you, actually. Let's see you again. Um, here's the way that I think about it. If two states have, an agree disagree have a general invocation of law in an agreement between them and agree to settle that, the meaning between themselves, that strikes me as evidence of state practice. If the same two states, instead of doing that or having tried to do that, fail and agree that they will be bound by the decision of a third party, whether an arbitrator's soul or a tribunal or a collegium, and what emerges is a decision by that third party, that I would view, it, view as delegated state practice and I would view it as something that they had agreed to beforehand as, what, as the meaning to be assigned to their particular 
treaty formulation. The jump comes in moving from one decision or a series of decisions of, with respect to terms such as fair and equitable treatment and extrapolating it to a larger universe. And here, I think I will refer to Judge Schwebel's award in Mandev. I, I won't bother pulling the exact language. You'll excuse me if I paraphrase it. The, the fact that the same phrase recurs in more than 1,000 or 2,000 treaties, uh, that repetition involves a certain accretion of uh, opinio juris. Now, in precise, if one looks for precise precision here, one encounters the same problem in all of opinio juris. I think it's John Dugard in one of his reports to the International Law Commission bemoans the problem of trying to find opinio juris in, in practice, the subjective expectation of what's right. I think, and I th think anyone who's tried to do that in an exercise in any aspect of international law knows what a daunting task it is. It seems to me that it's much easier in circumstances in which, at least with respect to two states, or a state, two states agree that in case of a dispute as to the meaning of a particular provision in a treaty, they will agree to be bound by the decision of a jurist applying international law. I find that e easier there to say that there's opinio juris. That, that is the theoretical construct with which I work. I, I thank you for the question, Patrick. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, my question goes back to the initial distinction you've made between evaluation rules and verification rules. And if I understood you correctly, um, you said that over time, rules belonging to one category can take on characteristics from the other category. And I might even take it a step further and say that over time, rules from one category can switch to the other ca category altogether. It still, it, it, it leaves, if I understand you correctly, it leaves uh, um, some way to the original assignment of rules to a certain category. So if you decided a certain rule is a verification rule, you would treat it differently. And I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that this assignment process is, is as simple because, as we know, these rules don't come with labels. So there's a, a degree of interpretation in this initial decision of which rule belongs to each category. Um, so, for instance, I'm thinking about, I think it was Hart, HLA Hart, who gave the famous example of no vehicles in the park, uh, but then um, changes in technology and, and in practices are so um, dramatic that it becomes an evaluation rule, even though when it was legislated, it seemed like a verification rule. So I'm wondering, in your view, do international arbitration panels have the authority to classify rules into one category or the other? If states would have taken a strong position that FET is a verification rule, not an evaluation rule, would have made it made any difference? I think they have no choice. It's determined by the linguistic structure of the rule. If the rule says fair and equitable treatment, there is no single metric that opens up to what is fair in context, what's equitable in context. A wide range of factors that are not specified have got to be brought to bear in determining what that means for purposes of its application. On the other hand, take a customary rule a verification rule, the first part of this century and the previous last part of the last century, of the 19th century, uh, the territorial sea was three nautical miles. That's a verification rule. Very important that it be treated as a verification rule. Binker's hoax alternative that the territorial sea is the length of a cannon shot doesn't have that precision. So I, I think that you have no difficulty detecting what is a, an evaluation rule when, you, when it comes to applying it. By the same token, you have no difficulty in understanding what a verification rule is when it comes to applying it. Though I take your point that in some circumstances, a verification rule uttered in an earlier era 
may depend on understandings that have become obsolete and require more, more consideration. But the intention of the lawmaker in, bo in both cases is to in limit the discretion of the applier as much as possible. With an evaluation rule, the intention is to give the applier, given the nature of the subject and the policies pursued, give the applier a wider discretion, a broader scope of judgment. Thank you for the question. If I may then, on Lori's behalf, on behalf of the society as a whole, and on behalf of certainly all of those, uh, those of us in the audience, thank first Charlie for making this possible, and Michael for delivering an absolutely first rate, and if I may say so, customary uh, lecture of, of your high standards. <laughs> Thanks all, we're done for now.